Science. Oh, All right. Yeah, it, it seems to do that to me sometimes. Oh, so I just God. don't know what else to do with it. Hey, we're over in Getting to Know Jesus, Volume 11, Lesson 144, and that's getting on to pages 140, uh, 139 to 152 in the book. Bible text, we have five pages of it tonight, uh, 140 to 144. Lesson notes of 145 to 150. It doesn't follow this. It doesn't. I, I, have, I tell you what, it really, I, I pulled this up. I've been through this before, but I started looking at my notes. I started looking at the Bible text and said, wait a minute, this isn't synchronized. And I had to put, uh, to get the Bible text on each little page, and sometimes they have to go three or four pages. I got it so out of order, I couldn't get it finished up Monday. We were working with the polls yesterday. I got it finished up today about noon or so. Oh, you having a hard time, Martha. But we got it together. Uh, you'll see as we go through here. together. Jesus is arrested. He doesn't. And we're talking about mice and men, not how to handle stress. So I see in all the things that I did, there's one thing I didn't get done. Mice tend to arrest Jesus. Oh, boy, Jesus is arrested. Mice versus men, contrary to what that... Ah, there we go. So Mice you got it right on that page. I don't know why I didn't get it right on that Mice page. versus men. And we're getting down here in our timeline. And I went to the edition and added another arrow to kind of be a little more specific in here. So we can see we are on Saturday night, or Friday night. Thursday night. Thursday night and the wee hours of Friday morning now is where we're going to be headed. So, we've often characterized people who are afraid of conflict or who run from difficult situations as mice. There's been somebody that you could think of that's a mouse. There have been a mouse at least one time or another. In like manner, men are those who face a difficult situation and address it in an appropriate manner and do the right thing. Sometimes that's the tough thing. More likely than not, there have been times when you did the mice thing. Hopefully you can also recall when you did the man thing. And I'm not speaking necessarily in gender. I'm speaking kind of gender neutral there in the man thing. That would make so the women the cats. That make the women a cat. Well, I don't want to be a mice around a cat. Or especially a hungry cat. But then I've seen some cats that play with mice and don't eat them. And yes, true. But then I watch a cat play with a mice that later ate. Richard? Yeah, I had a friend of mine used to say, Are you a man or a mouse? And he says, I like cheese. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, I like cheese, but I don't want to be a mouse. At least not in this context. See, in this visit with Jesus, we're going to make some comparisons between some mice and some men. We're in Matthew chapter 26, verses 47 to 56. Mark 14, 43 to 52, Luke 22, 47 to the first part of verse 54, and John 18, verses 2 through 12. Jesus has finished his private prayer time with God. He's now ready to face the trial and tribulation that he must endure, endure to pay for your and my sins. And I can tell you right here, before we go any further, some of you are going to think, I've got a, a, a cart full, a truckload full, a, a, a semi-trailer full, load full, of, and Jesus took it all for me. Mm -hmm. and, and most of all, I don't want to put you under a guilt trip for your sin of the past. It's all paid for. I want to lift that burden off your shoulder and help you uh, understand and appreciate what Jesus did for you. Last time, week we talked about stress. Well, if you let Jesus realize that he's paid, it's, he, it's under the blood, you don't need to be stressed out about the past. And you don't need to be stressed out about the future either. Uh, so as we observe the life of Jesus over the remaining Getting to Know Jesus lessons, we are going to see that he is in full control of his life. Nothing happens here without him basically allowing it, or even in many cases willing it, to happen. So what can he teach us about standing up for our faith? <clears throat> well, we're going to start off here. Mice come to arrest Jesus. Matthew chapter 26, verses 47. Mark 14, 43. Luke 22, 47. And John 18, verses 2 and 3. I don't know if 
if that will make any difference or not, but we'll try. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew his place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So just as he, Jesus, was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, appeared to the grove, the uh, garden, uh, olive grove, where Jesus was. With him was a large crowd, guiding a detachment of soldiers, armed with swords and clubs, and some officials from the chief priests, teachers of the law, and elders of the people. Go back then. You're not supposed to be in that big of a hurry. There we go. And the Pharisees, and they were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. You see, you get Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're telling the same story, but obviously they're each telling it from their own perspective and giving us little details that some of the others leave out. Christy. You're saying late Thursday night plus midnight uh, For the Jews, sundown, uh, the new day began at sundown. <coughs> so, although we would call it Thursday night, they're going to call it Friday morning. This was their Friday morning. The sun is down now. They're in the garden. It's dark. They're praying. And these guys come after sundown, Friday morning. Now, they want to get this all done before sundown Saturday night because the sundown, uh, sundown Friday night, because sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night is their Sabbath, and they don't want to do that kind of stuff. They think they're righteous if they don't do that on Sabbath. So... <laughs> Jesus has finished praying, and he sees a crowd of people with torches and weapons approaching, led by Judas. Now, Judas probably led them to the upper room first, although we don't know that. And, but after seeking, seeing that Jesus had left, he takes him to the Garden of Gethsemane because he knows Jesus likes to go there to pray. So if he's not in the upper room, I know where to find him. He'll be over here in the Garden of Gethsemane. The crowd of priests and elders and teachers and soldiers armed with swords and clubs. They're prepared for a fight, and they come in a large contingency against 12, basically, unarmed men. Now, we know from the earlier discussion that Peter had a little uh, hand sword, not probably a knife, probably not all that long, uh, definitely inadequate against broadswords and belly clubs and, and a whole, I don't know, two, three, four, five dozen people, trained soldiers. These are just fishermen, not trained fighters. Right. So it, it's, it's kind of like, but it's not unlike when a police go to do a, a drug raid on a house uh, and they don't know what's going on inside there. They'll take 20, 10, 20 policemen right. to arrest one man because they don't know what kind of uh, problems they're going to run into. And basically they did the same thing here to Jesus. Now they believe that they are justified in what they are doing. Well, we'll see about that. And, and this again, most of the things that you have done, even the sins in your past, you believed were justified at the time you did them. Oh, it's okay for me to do this. I didn't get caught last time. I won't get caught this time. Sometimes it's that mentality. Uh, some people don't realize that what they did was wrong until they get caught. Uh, some people realize, well, maybe all wrong for some people, but it's okay for me. And they'll find some justification. Well, they did this to me, so I, they had it coming, and they deserved it, and, or whatever. Now, all kinds of lame excuses to justify the sins in our life and the things that we do even today that we know are wrong. <clears throat> Why you need a conscience telling you, you know that's wrong, you don't want to even go down that road, so you'll stop it before you get there. But they believe that they were doing something good. Now, cowardly people will seek to do their work in larger numbers and at times when they will receive less public notice. You'll notice a lot of the crimes that are committed are committed after dark. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm sure there's quite a number that are committed in the daytime. It depends on the nature of the crime and, and possibly the location. But the idea is that in the night, it's harder to see the perpetrator doing what the perpetrator is doing. Mm -hmm. And so they think that they can get in, get out, do whatever they're going to do their dastardly deed and get away with it and not get caught because it's dark and you can't see them as well to make out who did it. They are often afraid and sometimes even stopped by confrontation of a strong leader from the opposition. Uh, if you see them doing it, the lights come on, a, a 
a whoa, 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 siren goes off or something like that. They say, whoops, somebody's going to see me, and they don't want to find out. Or they hear you say, I've got a gun. Or they hear, chink, chink. They know that sound, and they don't want to find out if you're a better shot than they are. They will generally, cowardly people don't want to stick around for the fight. They'll intimidate you, they'll bully you, until they find out you're ready to, to step back to them, and then it's a whole different ballgame. Morty? When God's way is depleted, you'll come up with religion, and religion mm -hmm. always is an attitude against God. Yeah. If we're not doing God's way, we're going to find a way to fall away from God's way and create all sorts of problems for ourselves. Well, let's go on here, because this is how not to treat mice. That's how I label this one. Matthew chapter 26, 48 to 51. Mark 14, 44 to 47. Luke 22, 47, B to first 50, and John 18, 10. And so John gets in on this situation just a little bit. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, the one I kiss is a man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once, he approached Jesus to kiss him, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus answered him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? That'll make you think about it. <clears throat> Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Now the men stepped forward. They seized Jesus and arrested him. And when Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with our swords? And with that, one of Jesus' companions, Simon Peter, John named him, standing near, reached for his sword, drew it out of his sword, had a sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. This one here. <laughs> The one that doesn't work on me. Probably worked quite fine on him before he got it cut off. The servant's name, by the way, John happens to point this out, was Malchus. Well, the apostles are obviously right around Jesus when Judas comes and kisses him to show the old soldiers who they are to arrest. So you you figure, here's Jesus, here's 11 men clustered very close around him, and here comes Judas, and gives him a kiss. Um, um, well, they, but Peter, when he uh, slashed the serpent ear, Jesus also healed that ear. We're going to get there in just a minute. Don't rush. <laughs> yep, you're See, Peter reacts by drawing a sword that he has with him. He lashes out and slices off the ear. Now, I would imagine that if he came up this way, headed for the neck, the Malchus went like this, and he sliced off the ear this way. If he came down from the top, Malchus, seeing about his head about to be split open, came like this, the sword glanced off his ear and maybe off of his shoulder. But it's his right ear. <clears throat> it was his right ear. So if I'm Peter, I'm slicing to this side of the guy in front of me. Peter was going for his head. He, I think he was going for his head. Whether it was coming <coughs> this way or this way, I believe he was going for his head. And Malchus was able to die. Malchus was lucky. <laughs> Malchus was able to, yeah. If Jesus would have put the head back on. I'm sure he could have. Wouldn't have been well, a good problem. I think that would have been a real right. yeah, <coughs> scare up to them if, if Jesus had done that. How come Peter hadn't settled for an ear? Well. <laughs> I'm sure Malchus felt bad enough with his ear laying down there on the ground, a whole bunch of blood gushing out of his face. And, uh, Jesus stops Peter and anyone else from taking any action because this is not how Jesus is going to fight his battle. Now, in contrast to some militant religions in the world or some, some militant people within their religions, Christianity has never been a religion Although Christians haven't gotten into wars with other Christians and with non-Christians, that's not been the way we've really perpetrated and advanced our Gospels. We do not force people to convert or die. We love people to want to follow Jesus. Some fashions of Christianity back in the day, in uh, the 1500s and the 1400s, oh, yeah. they were killed because their beliefs were just slightly different from the Catholic Church. 
Yeah. Or other. Or uh, uh, who is the king that killed the bunch? Because they weren't a lot. They weren't uh, following the way he followed. Them. So that if there you were, follow, you get killed. Mm -hmm. That's there were battles the between the Protestant the Christians Christian. and the Catholics. Right. And of course, this happened primarily after the Lutheran Re Reformation. That's right. Uh, there were battles between the Christians and the Muslims that happened even before that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, so there have been those times when uh, maybe uh, in some cases the Christians were fighting for their survival and their right to exist. Uh, there were some times when I think they were the aggressors in the situation. So even Christians aren't perfect. Like the Crusades. Right? Yes, Richard. In Canada, there's whenever the Protestants took over Canadian politics, they drove out the, um, the French Acadian Catholic. A lot of them moved down in Louisiana. Uh, that was the day of a man by the name of Everest Hebert, H-E-R-B-E-R-T, but pronounced Hebert, uh, became a New Testament preacher, and he, he immersed, I think, 3,000 Catholics. Uh, started a lot of New Testament churches in Louisiana. It was okay. back in the 1930s. So, yeah. Martha. I just want to mention one more thing. The Slavics uh, back in the uh, 13, 1400s, I've been studying this. Uh, the king at that time of the um, Tortoise, tort <laughs> that's the way you pronounce it. But anyway, uh, the king hired somebody, a couple of guys, to make a religion, I mean, make an, alpha, excuse me, make an alphabet for these two guys to develop so that they could change some of the Catholic doctrine into the Slavics. Well, wow. It's so fascinating. I well, there, there's a lot of fascinating history that yeah. we have yet to discover or rediscover. Jesus stops Peter and anyone else from taking action because this is not how he's going to fight his battle. Even though they are easily outnumbered, it's possible, though very unlikely, that they could have prevailed against the, uh, the army that trained soldiers. Still, Jesus isn't going to build his kingdom by weapons of war and killing. This is not the way the church is supposed to operate. And this is part of the reason why we're not bringing guns to church and looking for somebody to go shoot that isn't a Christian. We want to love them to Christ, not just condemn them to hell and shoot them or something. Uh, Jesus has a much better plan in mind. He takes a moment to heal the slave's ear in front of all those who have come to accuse him of being a bad person. I wonder what they thought about this. And yeah, Richard, it's interesting. What would they have thought if he had successfully lopped off Malchus' head and Jesus had said, here, and put it right back on. I wish that would have happened. But look at the but, impact it had on the servant. Yes. What did that on the servant? To have his ear healed back on oh. to his head. Oh, I'll bet Malchus was a convert yeah. right then and there. Yeah. I think he felt stupid to be out there trying yeah. to arrest the guy that was the healer. I know. I was thinking. Yeah. That's it. Let's see. Now, they're arresting this guy for doing something good to me? Mm -hmm. Jesus is not afraid of weapons and the people who bear them or their number. In fact, we can observe that Jesus is in full control of the situation. He will not be arrested without his permission. He will protect the apostles from any danger to them, and he will even heal the servant whom Peter attacks in an effort to put up some sort of self-defense. Jesus isn't afraid or intimidated by those who come to bring him harm. He can stand strong in the face of danger. How many of us, if we were in similar circumstances, knowing what was coming even, could we stand strong in the face of danger? Christy. Why did Jesus heal Malchus here? Because Jesus didn't want to perpetuate his kingdom by violence. And by healing Malchus, number one, it showed that I'm not here to fight you guys. I'm here to work with you, per se. And this is all part of my father's plan for me to go through this. Number two, it really puts shame on those who are against Jesus to see him do such a kind act. I mean, if, if, if you were against Jesus, you wouldn't want him doing something nice to you. You'd rather him fight you because you're angry at him. You're just looking for an excuse. You're looking for an excuse to kill him or beat him up or whatever. And here he comes and he heals one of your own who was injured in, in this situation.
Well, mice versus men. Now, I don't know which tree Jesus prayed under when Judas came and kissed him. But it's probably here in this garden somewhere. Well, man, a man, in that generic sense of the, uh, uh, non-gender specific sense of the word, stands up to mice. Matthew chapter 26, <laughs> verse 51 to 56a. Mark 14, 46 to 49. Luke 22, 15 to 53. And John 18, 4 through 9 and verse 11. So we're going to start over in John for this account. Now, knowing Jesus, Jesus knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and he asked them, who is it you want? Now this is after Judas has kissed him, after Peter sliced off Malchus ear, and Jesus put it back. He said, who do you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. And he asked them, who is it you want? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Amen. Remember that prayer just a yeah. few minutes earlier? That was just a few minutes earlier before they went out here to the garden and, and maybe an hour or two, uh, depending on how much time Jesus spent in prayer before they came to arrest him. But Jesus answered and commanded Peter, put your sword away. Put it back in the place. Jesus said, for all who draw the sword will die with the sword. Do you think I cannot call to my Father and He will send at once at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the Scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Shall I not drink the cup my Father has given me? No more of this. And he touched a man's ear and healed him. And at that time Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers, the temporary guard, the elders who had come for him, I am, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? <coughs> Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me or lay a hand on me. <coughs> but this is your hour when darkness reigns. This has all taken place that the writings of the prophets or the scriptures must be fulfilled. Matthew likes that scriptures must be fulfilled. Richard? Interesting insight. Uh, in the original, King James has I am he. Uh, he's in italics supplied by the translator. So they came up and says, Are you Jesus? You actually said, I am. I am. And the scriptures say they stepped back and staggered back because here's their creator. Verse. And, yeah. Uh, they stepped back and staggered back. And then I guess the command says, Bring them back better alive or we're going to have your hands. Basically, any, any lukewarm Jew would understand that I am was a reference only to Jehovah God, Amen. the creator of heaven and earth, the Father of our Lord Jesus. So Jesus standing up and saying to them, I am, yeah, it's basically saying, I'm God, what are you going to do about it? Mm. What are you going to do about it? What you... uh, this had to be heart-rendering to, to Jesus. Because here he is, his, he said, I am. This is his creation. This is what I thought about all the I own this. I have control of that. These mm. he made, he created all these people. Mm. And so on, through the natural natural yeah. means and so on. Oh, and here they are coming against the very creator that created them. That's what's been going on right now. The pain, the pain of the rejection has already started. Yeah. I would suggest that the pain of rejection started probably about the time he came down off of Bethany and said, okay, go get that donkey let me ride into Jerusalem. He's been dealing with the pain of rejection and it's been building all week long. How to let go of stress. Well, let's go on here. A man stands up to mice. The, when the entourage first arrived, Jesus asked them what they wanted and when they say they're looking for Jesus, he identifies himself as the one they are seeking. Now, first, they fall back as if in fear. The question is repeated, and, and, uh, and when replying, he directs them to let the apostles go. 
Now Judas has betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Kiss Jesus ridicules his captors for coming to get him in the way that they have come. He has been available every day in the temple. Why didn't they arrest him there? No, they come at night when darkness reigns because they do not know what they are doing and would not be tolerated by most of the people in town. There are a lot of Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, in Bethany, in Bethpage, just all around them here. And if they did this in the daytime, there would be a crowd pretty quick. And uh, a lot of that crowd, if not the majority of it, would be against what they are doing. But they do it at night and they think they're getting away with something. Real men are not afraid to face a situation and stand for what is right and true. Period. When they face danger and confront wrongdoers because they know what is right and true. We often think of soldiers, police, firemen, or emergency medical personnel who face sometimes life-threatening situations with little regard for their life and full dedication of helping others. I should have looked it up and printed it out. Something that was shared with me about, well, it was not with me, but shared with the world. Um, some about, oh, 11, 10, 11, 12, 13 years ago about the cowboys in the cowboy movies. You know, the good guys wore the white hat, and they weren't maybe perfect, but they always stood for what is right. They didn't go picking for a fight, but they didn't back away when a fight came to them. And uh, so forth. It's a very interesting observation that you can get from both of the Western that the a lot of us grew up on. The bad guy wore the black hat. The bad guy wore the black hat. That's right. Martha? <laughs> well, the Shirandrin uh, met, well, this is kind of ahead of myself right now. But it was, against, it was against Jewish law for them to meet at night to begin with and have them arrested at night. That was against the Jewish law. I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but I wanted to put those two. You're getting ahead of us too, but that's okay. It's good. <laughs> Go ahead and tell them. We'll get there. Okay. Yeah, well, we're going to deal with that next week. Oh, okay. You would not want mice to protect you from an attacker or rescue you from a life threat. Let me get caught up with my PowerPoint here. We want men. We want people who have got some understanding of the importance of their job. Who was it that went when everybody was going down on the World Trade Center? Who was going up? The firemen. Firemen, firemen. firemen and the police yeah. who were risking their lives yeah. to try in hopes that they might get more people out. And they all got killed. You know, recently they had a memorial service for the dogs. You used to oh. sit these people with the firemen and the policemen that were underneath the rebel. Some of them lived only because these dogs found them. Some yeah. of them have died because of old age. Yes. But I mean, it was, yeah. I thought it was great that they did that for the dogs. Not that they understood what was going yeah. on, but they were part of the heroes. Mm -hmm. Those dogs were heroes. Yep. Absolutely. Well, we've got one more, and that is a mice flea. Matthew, tell you, yeah, mice are full of fleas, probably. <laughs> Matthew 26, verse 56, B, Mark 14, 50 to 52, Luke 54, John 18, 12. Then seizing him, the uh, detachment of soldiers with its commander and Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and led him away. Then all the disciples, everyone deserted him and fled. What did Jesus say they were going to do when he was in there at the Last Supper? Now here's another little, here's another little side note, just for your entertainment purposes. Guess who wrote this? Possibly, we don't know, the guy that's telling this is what happened to him. This is Mark's Gospel. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus when they seized him. He fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Oh well, they call him the street. After Jesus has scolded and chastised those who have come to arrest him, he is bound and led away. It is at this point that the apostles decide that it is time for them to leave. And instead of following Jesus, they turn and run into the darkness. Mm -hmm. At this moment, they're being mice. And we've all been there one time or another. Peter and John will later appear at the trial, and most, if not all, of the apostles will be present at the crucifixion. We don't know if all of them were there or not. Some of them may have been so afraid that they were afraid to be there. I don't know. 
For now they are in fear of their own lives, and having been admonished not to fight, they take to flight. Morty? Yeah. Uh, let's give them a little credit, though, because they didn't understand at this point what was happening. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't true. understand this until Pentecost. Yes, sir. Right. That's right. And from that point on, then it would really grip them and get a hold of them. Yeah. So I'm yeah. sure even though they were scared and ran, they were confused. Because they've been to this guy for three and a half years. Yeah, three yeah. years. Three years. Now, yeah, three years and now. Intently for two years. Yeah. Now look. Now he's going to the cross and going to die. <clears throat> wow, what's going on? What's happening? So that, I, I can understand they're running. That's why this comment up here, I would not be too hard on the apostles here because I know that after Jesus rises from the dead, they will become such solid men they will never turn away in fear again. Right. Every one of them, with the exception of the apostle John, was murdered yeah. before their time. John was the only one that got we to live to, to be an old age. We went to an island of Patmos. Yeah, island of Patmos. We just saw a, a video that Bob loaned us oh, this week. You should watch it. Uh, done by Dean Jones of the Apostle John talking from the Isle of Patmos describing this oh, this whole scenario yeah. in such like I was there detail it made you feel it. Like you were there. Very interesting story. You can talk to Bob about that he might even might let you look at After it. After my sister. Maybe How long is the clip? Well, it's nine, two minutes. It's 90 minutes. Yeah, 90 I would like minutes. to see it. Well, well my sister has it right now. So mice will <laughs> flee with danger. They have no strength or foundation. <laughs> They're more concerned with covering up their sins than they are about doing what right. So how many times have you been a mouse in a situation where you needed to be a man? And I can tell you there have been times when I should have stood up and been more bold and I went. So I hate to admit it, but let's be honest, there have been times when I've went and I've compromised and I've had to, sometimes I've been able to, had to eat it, sometimes I've been able to go back and and stand up with a little more fortitude. There are situations where I can be bold, and there are some situations where it's a challenge. And then probably many of you face similar situations. You got that look on your face. Yeah, because some of those been times when I've been a mouse and not a woman. And I've been a woman and not a mouse. <laughs> well, yeah. It works for You're both. It works for both ways. <laughs> I tell you, I need to learn to stand up for myself more often. Uh, and we all do. There are times when, now some of us are a little too bold, we maybe need to mellow a bit, but a lot of us, most of us can probably, uh, at certain times, need to be a little more bold. You should consider the times when you have stood up in a hostile crowd and spoken up for the truth and put your life on the line for someone else without regard to the danger to yourself. So even though there's been the times when you've done the mouse thing, there have been times where you have been bold. And so don't just knock yourself down. Recognize that you have that ability. Recognize the power of the Holy Spirit in you today to give you that ability. And just pray, God, help me to stand strong. Help me to see it coming so I can kind of plant my feet and get ready to take the first punch, figuratively speaking, so I can stand up for Jesus and not back down or be shoved into a corner or beaten down or whatever. Well, the conclusion is this. Are you a man enough to stand with Jesus? Don't let the world scare or intimidate you from standing up for your faith. Now next week, Jesus will endure the late hours of the night and into the morning being questioned by the priests, the teachers of the law, and the Sanhedrin. He will get no rest, no consideration, no kindness in any form shown to him as he goes through this abuse in preparation for his crucifixion just hours away. And all parties. We're, we're good. And all fulfilled what was told in the Old Testament. So come and see how he not only stands up to the trials, but maintains full control of his own crucifixion execution. We're going to break up into discussion groups now. Turn over to page 151 for our discussion questions. You can follow us and stay in touch with what is happening with the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry on Plaxo, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and watch our video clips on YouTube and GodTube. 
Getting to Know Jesus is sponsored by New Hope Gospel Ministries. If you'd like to follow along with us and start your Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study group, or just pray for us or support our ministry, you can go to www.gettingtoknowjesus.org and find all the information that we have available for you. If you look at the lower right-hand corner, there's a button where you can make a safe and secure donation to the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry. Or you can go to the order page and order your Getting to Know Jesus books for your Bible study group. Thank you for stopping by and keep us in your prayers and let us know how we can pray for you.